The scripture for this morning, upon which Pastor Cindy will be focusing, comes to us from Paul's second letter to Timothy, the first chapter beginning with the opening verse. Hear these words. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Do not be ashamed then of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel." For this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. And for this reason I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed. For I know the one in whom I have put my trust. And I am sure that he is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. This reveals to us the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week we celebrated Stewardship Sunday and, and Pastor Kyle shared with you how grateful he is and we all are that all of us have teamed together in continuing to be faithful in giving to God, both in service and in financial gifts, many going above and beyond in this strange year of 2020 and the pandemic. And lives are being touched and continue to be touched through your faithfulness. We thank you for that. And this week, last week, Pastor Kyle said that it was everyone's favorite Sunday of the year. And so if that is the favorite Sunday of the year, this has to be the second most favorite Sunday of the year, Commitment Sunday. And, and Commitment Sunday is a time when, as Pastor Kyle has shared, we will celebrate the commitments that we are presenting to God uh, throughout this past week and in the coming days as well as today. We'll ask God's blessings on those commitments. And we will ask God's blessings on those who will be blessed and whose God's grace will touch in the coming year through our giving and through our serving. The scripture that Pastor Kyle read for us is about, uh, is written from a prison cell by Paul, the Apostle Paul, to his protege, Timothy, a young pastor. He writes to him to encourage him and to try and instill a faithful encouragement in his life during what must have been a fear-filled time. Many were afraid of stating their faith. They were afraid of imprisonment. Others were turning completely away from the faith. And Paul encourages him to hold on to the faith that you have received and, and to be courageous. Timothy, we read in verse 4, shed tears it was probable that these tears were shed at his parting from Paul, and he found himself very alone. We know a little bit about feeling alone in 2020, don't we? Even if we're alone with our family and, and feelings of isolation and not knowing what tomorrow holds for our jobs, for our health, for our families, and for our lives. And so, as I read through that, many preachers will often preach on rekindling the flame from this passage, and that's a great sermon to preach. Others will preach on the importance of passing down the faith from one generation to another, as Timothy's mother and grandmother have done in his life. But what, what really spoke to me as I read this passage in preparing for today 
was God's treasure that lies in each of us. So we're going to look more at that today, and I invite you to pray with me as I pray for us. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise as we gather together this morning, both remotely and in person. We ask that you would speak your words of life to us today. Fill each place from which we gather and, and this sanctuary in which others of us find ourselves full of your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and speak through me, I pray. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. In verse 6 of today's passage, Paul focuses on the gifts of God in a spirit of gratitude. And we see this as Paul gives thanks for Timothy's grandmother and for his mother. These are gifts in our lives when we have family members of faith. Paul's thankful for Timothy's faith. And in verse 6, for the opportunity he's had to play a part in shaping that faith and watching Timothy grow in that faith. Paul, as I shared, writes from a prison cell, and, and we might think he'd be anxious or, or, or be asking Timothy to work out something legally for him to be released, but we don't read that. Instead, we read words overflowing from a thankful heart. The mentor, Paul, helped Timothy and, and helps us to see something that's much bigger than ourselves. Every believer is a part of Christ's ministry, and when we face difficult times, gratitude can put things in perspective. In verse 6, he tells Timothy to rekindle the gift. The greatest gift we've been given is referred to in verse 9, that grace that comes not according to our works, but according to God's own purpose and grace. We may think of ourselves, especially in this season of commitment and stewardship emphasis, as investing in God's kingdom through giving of our tithes and our offerings, giving our time, our talents, our service, our witness, and the encouragement that we give to one another. But Paul reminds us that God first made an investment in you and I. This is God's gift to us. In verse 3, the mentor writes that he prays night and day for Timothy as well as for all of his churches. Paul also was likely praying for his enemies and those who opposed the faith. On our own strength, we will fail when under pressure. And all of this leads to Paul's statement that we should get in touch with the giver. He doesn't use those exact words, but that's the message he's conveying. In verse 8, he counsels Timothy that he too can make it through these difficult times if he will live a life relying on the power of God. The word for relying in the original Greek that Paul wrote these words in means to rely today, to rely tomorrow, to, re to rely the month after tomorrow and, and the year after this year, to keep on relying, to day by day place our faith in God and in God's power. If we try to rely on our own power to face life's challenges, we will fail. Timothy and we must get in touch with the giver of the gift if we are to receive that power. We must stay in touch with the giver. Paul shares his personal testimony, but I am not ashamed for I know I have relationship with the one in whom I've put my trust and my faith. If we want to experience God's power at work in our lives, then we too must get in touch with the giver and place our lives into that, those hands. I'd like to reread for you from 2 Timothy uh, verses 12 through 14 in that first chapter. And as I read, I encourage you to listen for the word entrusted and how it is used. And for this reason I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I have put my trust. And I am sure that he is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. 
The word for entrusted used in the original Greek here is a very vivid word that's filled with meaning. Paul talks about that which he has entrusted to God. And then he urges Timothy to guard, to protect that which God has entrusted to him. The word is parathiki, which means a deposit committed to someone's trust. A person might deposit something valuable with a family member or friend for safekeeping, knowing that when it's needed later, you can go to them and get it back. In ancient times, one might deposit one's valuable item in the temple. The temple was used much as a bank. In each case, the thing, depo- the thing that was deposited was called a, parath- a parathiki. I'll, I'll be able to say that by the time we're done today. There was no duty more sacred than for someone to trust you with a parathiki, to give it to you knowing you would keep it safe for them and return it when the time was right. There was a famous Greek story that circulated uh, before the time of Christ about how important a trust was. The Spartans were famous and well-known for their honesty and their honor. A certain man from Miletus went to seek out a man from Sparta named Glaucus. He said he had heard so many great reports of the honesty of the Spartans that he had taken his possessions, took half his possessions, converted them to money, and then went to Sparta to give them to this stranger he'd never met named Glaucus based only on Glaucus's reputation. He wanted to deposit the money with Glaucus until he or his heirs would return to claim it. They exchanged symbols that would serve to identify who the rightful claimant was for these monies. And the years went by. The man of Miletus died. His sons traveled to Spartus to see Glaucus. They presented presented the identifying tallies and asked for the return of the money that had been deposited with him. Glaucus wasn't quite honest, and as a matter of fact, he out and out lied, and he said he had no memory of ever having received such a deposit. The sons of Miletus left with their heads hanging low and nothing to show for their efforts. Nothing left that their dad had wanted kept safe to be passed on to his family. Glaucus felt some guilt over this and he decided he'd go visit the famous oracle at Delphi that spoke, um, they believed, on behalf of the god Apollo. He went to the oracle at Delphi to ask if he should be honest about having received the trust, or as Greek law would allow him to do, swear he knew nothing about it. The oracle answered him, basically saying, Glaucus may do as he wishes. He may swear he never received the deposit and keep the money. After all, those who die, uh, there are both honest people and dishonest who die, so do what you will. But the oracle said, those who keep their oaths will have a flowering offspring, meaning that person's children and grandchildren and future generations will be many and will be blessed. They will prosper. Glaucus understood that the oracle was telling him if he wanted instant gain, he should deny ever knowing anything about this trust, but that such a denial would bring eternal loss. He sent for the sons of the man from Miletus who had died, and the sons came back and he returned to them their money. But Glaucus died with not one descendant, not one heir, not one family root left in Sparta. And the moral of the story was, it's a good thing when a pledge has been left with one, not even in thought to hesitate to return it. To the Greeks, parathiki was completely sacred. And it was an honor to be chosen for someone to give their parathiki to you. Paul says he has made his parathiki with God. He has trusted God with everything he has done, with with the churches he has planted, with the lives he has touched. He is placing all of this into God's hands from that prison cell. 
And it may seem to Timothy and to others among the early Christians that Paul is a failure. He's a prisoner, a Roman captive, and that all the work he's done for Christ doesn't matter anymore. But Paul had preached the gospel. He had planted churches, and he chose to leave the results in God's hands. Paul had placed his whole life as a parathi key into God's hands. And he knew that in life and in death, he was safe. Why was he so sure? Because he knew in whom he believed. And it's important to note, Paul didn't say he knows what I believe. He didn't say, Timothy, I know what I believe. I know the creeds. I know the... I, I know the Scriptures that we have in our time, those, those Old Testament scriptures. He didn't say, I know what I believe. He said, I know who I have placed my belief in. I know who I've given that parathiki to. It came out of a personal relationship that he had developed with God through Christ. A knowledge of, of God's will and, and of God's vision for others. He knew God's heart. He knew what God was like and how we are to live and how we are to love and that we need the power of God at work in our lives if we're going to do that. And Paul couldn't imagine failing with God's power on his side. When we offer to God our best, when we really place our trust in God, our lives in God, God will give us the power no matter how insignificant we might think our actions are. With God, life is safe because nothing can separate us from that power. But there's another side to this matter of trust going on in this passage. There's another parathiki at work. Paul urges Timothy and us to safeguard and keep unbroken that parathiki that God chose to give to you. God has placed his parathiki in each of us. And honoring us and trusting us to keep that until we see him again one day. When God wants something done, God looks for someone to do it. If God wants a child taught, a message brought, a sermon preached, a meal shared, a shelter given, a sorrowing one comforted, a sick one healed, God looks for someone through whom God can work to extend God's grace and God's touch to that life. Paul's next words tell us to guard the good treasure that has been entrusted to you. How many movies and TV series have focused on searching for lost treasure? Some people spend countless days and, and months and years of their lives looking for hidden treasures or lost treasures whether it's lost pirate treasure or the lost treasures of Hitler buried in some remote field that have yet to be found or other treasures that have been lost, that people long to find them. People search for lost and hidden treasures to become rich. And Paul tells us we're in possession of a treasure already. And he, he encourages us, guard that treasure Guard the treasure entrusted to you by God. And I find that interesting on Commitment Sunday, a Sunday when we think of offering our financial commitments to God, that we're reminded that God has made an investment in you and me, that God has given to each of us a good treasure. Paul isn't talking about a financial investment by God in our lives. That good treasure refers to the teaching of the apostles who were among those first eyewitnesses of all Jesus did and taught. And we find those stories recounted in the scriptures. Most of the disciples were at the foot of the cross when Jesus breathed his last breath. They saw and heard the risen Christ who, after he died, rose again to new life on the third day, who brought healing and hope to those around him. God's investment in our lives includes the gifts of faith and love made possible through Jesus Christ. Paul writes about how God sent his son Jesus to pay the price for these gifts, that all who believe in the resurrected Christ can receive these gifts in our lives at no charge. We must protect 
those gifts at all costs. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you, we are told. Chris Wyman was a terminal cancer patient. He was 39 years old, newly married, newly published, and now facing certain death. He and his wife were in deep grief about the life that would never be his to live. And then one morning, wrote Wyman, we found ourselves going to church. We found ourselves going to church. And he wrote those words again, found ourselves. That's exactly what it felt like, he writes. Wyman continues, so that we were casting aside the Sunday paper and moving toward the door with barely a word between us, as if once inside the church, we were discovering exactly where and who we were meant to be. They went on long walks talking with God. They navigated through deep sadness that spoke to them of God's own grief. And as he faced death, Wyman found no big discovery of glories but rather he writes the quiet assurances that the same presence of God that was with him in this life awaited him on the other side of the wall. And so we celebrate that on this Commitment Sunday, our financial gifts are just the beginning. We are invited to entrust, to give our parathi key to make that deposit to God that includes not just our finances, but every part of our lives, our time, our worship, our talent, our prayers, our resources, our service to others, as well as our witness and sharing about our experience of God and ways we see God at work around us. And it's then that we can truly find ourselves. And what about the good treasure God has entrusted to you? In what ways are you guarding that treasure? And the good news is, we don't guard this treasure alone. We have the help of the Holy Spirit living in us and through us. And then we can say with the Apostle Paul in the words to that well-loved him, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded, I'm convinced that he is able to keep that which I've deposited, which I've committed unto God against that day. In the name of Jesus the Christ, amen. Greetings, friends. Pastor Kyle here once again, and I want to thank you for taking the time to join with us for worship this day. Whether you're a member of First UMC and you're out of town or you're worshiping from home at this time, or if you're a guest, know that we are so glad that you joined with us today. And we'd love to hear from you, especially if this is your first time worshiping with us here at the Stillwater First UMC. I would love for you to give us a call or send us an email at the phone number or the address listed below. Let us know your name, where you're worshiping from, how we can get in touch with you, and also let us know how we can be in prayer for you. What joys and concerns do you have upon your heart? And how can we partner with you in aiding you to grow in your discipleship? Also, if you would like to support the mission and ministries of the Stillwater First UMC, you may do so by going to our website at the link below and clicking on the Give button. Or you can text GIVE to the phone number listed below. Know that we look forward to partnering with you to build God's kingdom here in Stillwater and in Oklahoma and around the world. I hope that you have been especially blessed by your time with us today, and I look forward to worshiping with you again in the future.